being on stage here right now in Maastricht in these super tumultuous and tense political times, I feel compelled as a scientist, as a UK and more importantly European scientist, uh, to say uh, that without collaboration, without Europe, without um, uh, cross-collaborative efforts, uh, as scientists, we're nothing. I mean, many of these projects, you know, the Large Hadron Collider, okay, the um, uh, nuclear fusion centre in, in Provence, the, the GPS satellite navigation system we have, they're incredible European collaborations, and I'm desperate, okay, for those collaborations to continue. I am European and will always be European. I'll stay like that, okay? Uh, and, and at... Okay. <laughs> And, and as I stand here right now on the stage, uh, I am missing, unfortunately, the hundreds of thousands of people who are walking or going on bus or trains to London right now to protest uh, and march in favour of the people's vote to at least give us the option to rethink this insanely important decision that we're taking. And it's our fault, you know, it's not, not your fault, it's, it's, it's our problem. We've got to have another think about this and think, what are we doing, okay? And so, uh, although I can't be there, uh, today on that march, and I would have been there with my whole family uh, in tow. Um, I hope at least making this statement and kind of publicly uh, is in some way contributing to that effort to get us to rethink and change our minds and stay with you all. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn it a bit sciencey now, so you might have to go with a bit of this, okay? Uh, but. I wanted to look at the origins of the, the word periphery, and it comes from um, uh, the meaning around um, and also to bear. Uh, and so this is where I work, and it's very much uh, in the periphery of Lima. This is up in the hills in southern Lima. It's a metropolis. It's a megacity of 10 million people, okay? And once you get to the, 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 the suburbs, it gets quite tough, and you get housing, which is run down. This is very much in the periphery. This is where I have to go to collect my samples and to meet people who have tuberculosis. Uh, and the, this is called the Pueblo Joven, which means young town, for those of you who don't speak Spanish. And that is because people come in from the Andes, and they come in from the jungle, and they literally stake their Peruvian flag in the ground, and they're protected by law for that small space they have around them to live there, okay? And it's mainly just sand or earth, okay? But that's where they stay, and they often stay for many future generations, and they remain, and they, if they get the chance, they get to build upon what they've put there uh, before. But this is where you find um, tuberculosis. This is a patient who's um, been infected with tuberculosis, and I'm not sure if this laser point is working very well, but you can see up at the top here, um, their lungs are just being destroyed by the, the bacteria. You've got loads of holes there uh, called cavities, uh, and those cavities can erode into the airways, and so you can cough the bacteria onto other people. All those cavities can erode into a major blood vessel, and so you can cough up loads of blood called hemoptysis, and that's often what kills people in the old days. Um, so uh, this is a lovely study by uh, Paulson in Nature uh, in 2013 that looked at the number of deaths over the last 200 years caused by tuberculosis compared to other uh, important infectious diseases. And as you can see, I mean, it's monstrous, really. It's killed a billion people over the last uh, 200 years uh, compared to you know, far more than all of these other uh, infectious diseases pretty much put together. Okay, And right now, it's the number one uh, single-agent infectious disease killer in the world. Okay, So approximately a quarter of the entire planet uh, is infected with tuberculosis. That's not to say they have horrible disease like you've just seen on the previous x-ray, but it's to say they're infected with the bug, so it's kind of with us. Uh, so I always like to try and understand where it's come from, the bug, or whatever I'm researching, I like to go right back to the beginning and see how it arose, okay? And so these are uh, remains from a tomb in Thebes, 2500 BC, um, where you can see in the femur here, uh, you've got a lesion that looked like it may have been caused by tuberculosis, so the, um, the paleobiologist removed uh, a bit of the femur, studied its DNA and found out indeed that it was uh, uh, tuberculosis, so we know it comes right from the origins of human evolution. And it can only live inside us, TB, so it's co-evolved with humans. Okay, it's a kind of human parasite in that way. 
and the major subdivisions of uh, TB, the major genetic groups, the major families of TB, TB, are exactly the same as the major human families. So there's a kind of Chinese type and a European type and an African type. Okay? Here on the left, you can see a poor baby that's been mummified. Uh, and, and that baby was also found to be infected with tuberculosis as well. So it's really been with us since the beginning of human time. Um, this is some work that I've been involved in as well because nobody knew when tuberculosis arrived to the new world. And this is a bit of a complex graph, sorry about this, but you can, you can uh, if, if you know the mutation rate of the bug, you can backdate it and you can work out, looking at the population today, uh, when it arrived uh, in the Americas. And in this lovely study by Ola Brunilstrud, I hope I've pronounced her surname uh, properly, um, uh, they and me together showed that actually uh, it looked like tuberculosis arrived pretty much with the conquistador. So it's one of those infections that we brought uh, to the South American people, the Inca people at the time in Peru, uh, and infected them, and it caused widespread uh, death in that community. Before, this is another rather elegant study, uh, you, have to, you have to do a really elegant study to get published in Nature. They won't accept any old rubbish. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in this study. I wish I was involved because it's a fantastic study where, where a group of researchers um, uh, and the primary author is by Boss in Nature w went down to the Atacama Desert in Chile and at three different sites they found um, uh, pre-Inca, so pre uh, Colombian mummies at three different sites and they found this disease again in the spine and they sent it off for, for uh, uh, DNA sequencing and in each site uh, they got a genetic code not of human tuberculosis but in instead this chap, uh, the seal. And it turns out that seals also suffer from a similar disease called Mycobacterium pinnipedi and seals got there to the new world predictably, before humans did. And of course, the humans ate the seals, and that's probably how they got uh, infected in the spine. Uh, so just a, a bit more uh, recently in, in history, uh, tuberculosis is thought to have killed um, uh, Simeonetta Vespucci, who was the muse of Botticelli's uh, Venus, and her famous pale skin um, was probably because she was coughing up huge amounts of blood. Um, yeah, and it was kind of thought to be quite cool to do that in those days. People, for some stupid reason, liked pale skin. It was quite bohemian, uh, lab om like to, to be dying slowly and artistically of, uh, of tuberculosis. <laughs> I can tell it's not that cool. Um, so also, we think that Chopin, uh, one of the most famous you know, um, piano composers, died of tuberculosis. And the reason, or one of the reasons we think this is the case is because his heart is pickled in cognac in a, in a church in Warsaw. Uh, and it, that was recently exhumed and uh, inspected. Uh, and because uh, the heart and soul of Chopin is so important to Poland and the Polish people, they wouldn't allow it to be sampled quite reasonably. Um, but the, 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 the histopathologist that looked at the, at the heart thought, yeah, that looks like tuberculosis pericarditis. I'm pretty much on that basis. It was put back in the column and will remain there. I think until 2060, when bizarrely we get another chance to, to look at it, so we can probably report back then. Um, okay, so, so people continue to die of tuberculosis until these two uh, guys came along. Uh, this on, on the right is Seliman Waxman, and on the left is Albert Schatz. And, and these guys worked on, uh, in the soil, okay, because uh, the, the kind of the family that TB comes from is called mycobacteria. It lives in the ground, right? That's where it originally comes from. Uh, and in the ground, there's a kind of microbial war that's going on between uh, the mycobacteria and other bacteria in the ground. They're all fighting together. So they thought, well, actually, what happens if we study the other bacteria? Maybe they will have a mechanism of killing tuberculosis. So if we study these bacteria, maybe we can find a toxin that kills tuberculosis. It's exactly what they did. And they studied multiple, multiple different types of, of actinomyces bacteria, and they eventually found a toxin that killed tuberculosis, which was called streptomycin, and for which uh, Seliman Waxman was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize um, and uh, patented the drug streptomycin. This, uh, of note, young people, uh, Albert, Albert Schatz was his PhD student, did a lot of the work, got absolutely no recognition at all. So this is quite an important case in the mentor and menteeship um, uh, to be aware of in, in history. 
And after these guys, we've developed multiple different drugs, thankfully, and now tuberculosis is a completely treatable disease with four drugs over six months. We expect most people who have sensitive, drug-sensitive disease to recover really well. Um, but you might ask, well, what is emerging about TB? This all seems to have emerged. It's already killed a billion people. Um, but uh, bizarrely, the word emergence itself is also emerging over time, um, so it seems. Um, but what we are seeing emerging, emerging in tuberculosis is drug resistance. Okay, and this is a really big problem. And it's not just in tuberculosis, it, it's in all drugs. It's, it's in all uh, uh, bacterial species, species. Even viruses and even fungi are becoming drug resistant because we're just throwing in antibiotics to animals. Okay, uh, and so everywhere we look, all over the world, we now see cases of drug-resistant tuberculosis. And so in other pathogens, for example, gut pathogens, that we now run the risk of going in for a straightforward operation, okay, just a routine like a hernia repair or something like that, and getting infected with a deadly uh, multi-drug-resistant organism okay, that just happens to be floating around in the hospital. Okay? So it's a real worry, antimicrobial resistance, and it's going to cost you know, the global economy millions if not trillions of dollars over the next 50 or 100 years so it's really important to be uh, aware of and you know and this is very much the case in tuberculosis as well um, so over the last uh, uh, so, so th this slides up here to say well what are we going to do about it right because we now know where it came from we now know what the problem is so the last bit of the talk is to say what we're going to do about uh, TB well actually you can see that just by improving poverty over time and improving the quality of living uh, and uh, sanitation and all of those improvements that were made following on from kind of Victorian times in the UK and elsewhere, uh, that's actually reduced the death rate massively uh, of tuberculosis. So we clearly need to do that and that's probably the most fundamentally important thing to do. But we need the UN and we need you know, um, policy makers to be driving that and to be improving that. So what my interest is, is what can I do as a kind of scientist, as an individual, to really try and explore this matter more? And I kind of believe, and hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties with this, I sort of believe that the secret uh, lies in the genetic code uh, of the bacteria. And I've put this slide up here because this uh, uh, code 4.5 million letters is one bacteria of tuberculosis, okay? And so we're just going to scroll down through it. I'm not going to read out every letter, but <laughs> it just gives you an idea that this code here just codes for one micron, one tiny micron bacteria, which has killed more people. Uh, it's one of humans' de deadliest enemies, okay? It's killed more people than any other infectious pathogen, and it's entirely coded for in this text, okay? And one letter, if one letter changes in that text uh, at a particular point in the genome, it will code for drug resistance. And so that, that bacteria will not respond to the drugs we're giving the person, okay? So I believe passionately that the secrets of this enemy lie in this code. And that's what I spend my time fiddling around and my nights thinking about uh, and, uh, and my research doing. Uh, so this just to show some of the things that I've been involved in with other collaborators, many of them European. Uh, I stress again. Uh, and this was, this was a paper that went out in the New England Journal by Tim Walker and the Cryptic um, Collaboration, where, where we've used the, used the genetic code that you've just seen of tuberculosis to move away from a Petri dish and growing it in the plate, okay, to move away from that and just to put the code through a computer that tells us the full readout of the drug resistance pattern based on the code. Okay, so already, just using the code, we're able to work out what the bug is doing, how it's evading us, okay? Oh, sorry. This is another study that, that I led in, in Peru with a colleague of mine called David Bowie. And, and here we took two people who have never met each other, okay? But we know they share exactly the same bacterial code. So the two people don't know how they've come across each other, but they have met because somehow they've given each other tuberculosis, okay? And, and we followed them. Uh, we took consent from them all, and we followed them, just like Google or Apple does, for a week only, uh, 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 around Lima. And you can see that the, you know, the, the person in green, 
uh, here went into the prison, and the person in purple went into the prison and around the prison and could well have infected each other there. And you can see in blue and green and, and uh, at the health post, sorry, in green and pink at the health post, people crossing there, maybe infecting themselves there, uh, and likewise. So hopefully if we, if we employ technology of this kind in bigger numbers, we'll be able to find out where people actually share these bacteria were in the air, okay, and intervene in those areas. Uh, and, and I'll just finish off by um, uh, highlighting another really top, lovely study um, done by Eliza Peterson, um, uh, where what she did was took, took TB, okay, in a Petri dish, exposed it to a drug, and watched how it kind of squirmed, how it tried to escape, okay, its means of escape when it's exposed to a drug. And if you look at those means of escape, she thought, well, maybe one of those means of escape I can hit with another drug. Okay, so that's to say you go up front with one drug and then you throw in intelligently another drug to smash it in combination. And I think this is massively important for the future, this kind of intelligent genome-based combination of drugs we're going to be able to use to uh, improve um, the treatment of people with TB. So I'll, I'll stop uh, on that and I'll just say thank you very much again for, for having me here.